What is going on everybody? Nazdarachi coming back at you again today with another 5-9 direct little news flash piece for you. Of course, we got a couple of topics that popped up throughout the weekend as well as some today to give you guys some coverage, get you up to speed. Of course, if you enjoy this type of content, please feel free to subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, because we would love to of course see you on all of our future uploads. So today we do have a few articles to go over again. We're gonna start off with the one you may be seeing on screen right now, of course, which Capcom did come out over the weekend and state that they intend to make PC their main platform for gaming. So this is kind of something that's been supported. We've seen recently over the past few years, we're getting releases like Devil May Cry, of course, Resident Evil Village, RE2 Remake, a lot of the games, even some Monster Hunter stuff, a lot of the games that Capcom has been making have been finding their way over to PC. According to Bloomberg reporter Takashi Mochizuki, the English recap of his Japanese language report, the Capcom president Haruhiro Sujimoto told the outlet at the Tokyo Game Show that it wants PC to eventually become its primary platform. Again, we have seen this. Um, something that they have committed to is saying that the new Monster Hunter Rise that just came out as a Switch exclusive now will also be coming to the PC, and I would assume that would extend to a lot of their future planned releases, which is great for me because that allows me to stream them on Twitch for all of you guys because I haven't currently bought into any of the new console generations. But with that being said, I'm a huge fan because I think that accessibility of games across all platforms, meaning however someone is able to access the content, the opportunity for that to be a reality is a very cool thing. And not only that, but a lot of the games are coming out with cross-play multiplayer these days, which means that whatever you can afford, whatever you were gifted, whatever you have at the time, be it the you know cheapest version of a PS5 or Xbox you can get your hands on, or the most built gaming PC you could possibly own, that those people will be able to interact with each other to keep the game populations healthy. Because I think that that's something that's cause the downfall of a lot of games is that on certain platforms they'll be more popular than on others and then that means that you know it's just a struggle to be able to find games and play sometimes so this is all good news in my opinion i'm a huge fan of capcom been a lifelong fan of their games all the way back to you know street fighter and the arcade cabinets up to you know things like monster hunter devil may cry and resident evil so great news there keeping in tune with the theme we got another major kind of vintage through the present producer of video games, Konami is inviting indie developers to make new games based on some of its classic series. So just like I mentioned, Konami has been around for pretty much my entire life as far as I know. I enjoyed plenty of their games on Super Nintendo and things from there onwards. So it's very interesting that they are diving back into their classic collection to try and get some indie developers. It's actually like a contest going on right now for this, for things like Gradius, Gunbar, Goemon, and a lot of their really retro games. Things that may have honestly not seen the light of day in a very long time that a lot of the younger generation maybe have never even heard of. They're trying to kind of reinvigorate some of those games from indie developers, and they have made an action and shooting game contest asking indie creators to plan and develop new action games and shooters based on Konami's past titles. I don't think this will get anywhere near some of the more recent stuff, obviously, that they've been putting out, but in terms of a lot of these old classics, like again, I wouldn't expect to see like anything Metal Gear Solid related in this, but for some of their really old and arcade-based games, this is pretty neat, and I'm a huge fan of indie games, but this is kind of like a fusion of both worlds, where the indie developers are taking something from a very large company that's been well-established and trying to spin something new about it. So, Konami specified 80 different games for creators to possibly reimagine, including games from Gradius, Star Soldier, Twin B, Gunbar Goemon, Nightmare, and others. The full list can be found at the bottom of the official entry page, which is all in Japanese, and I can't read that. I'm not Goresh, so I'm not gonna bother looking at that. 
I'm sure there are tons of games that I've honestly probably never even heard of on this list before myself. It comes at an interesting time for Konami as a whole. A recent report says the company is beginning to refocus on its own series and becoming more open to allowing third parties to develop games within them. While Konami itself is apparently handling new games for Castlevania, Metal Gear Solid, Silent Hill, this contest seems to allow some of its lesser known or more cult favorite series to reemerge through different means and channels. Again, Konami has been kind of a weird spot recently. Of course, we all know they had the tiff with Kojima, separated from him, which kind of puts Metal Gear in a kind of a weird spot. Of course, Konami still owns most all the rights to Metal Gear, so they can continue to do something with it, which is what we've actually seen recently. They've kind of been delving into like the pachinko scene a lot recently, instead of focusing on producing actual video games. So hopefully this, amongst other things, like the announcement of new games for Castlevania, Metal Gear, Silent Hill, between this indie game contest, this reemergence of classic games, as well as them working on the main titles, hopefully we see a shift of Konami going a little bit back to their old ways, where they're actually producing really good video games and not just like pachinko and gambling related machines. So I'm hugely in favor of that. On to the next topic. Sony itself is introducing game trials. Try PS5 games for a limited time. So it's very important. We take right from the article that this is going to be limited to the PS5 system. I don't think there's going to be any retroactive adaptation for the PS4, but it seems like Sony's trying to take a clever move kind of almost out of like blockbuster or game flies, you know, strategy where you can kind of rent the game. It's, it's free in this instance. So, you know, you don't have to actually pay for it like you would going to a store or Gamefly or anything like that, but you are very limited on your play time. I think it says up to six hours for Death Stranding Director's Cut specifically, and then Sackboy, A Big Adventure has a five hour trial. So it seems it might vary between games, but essentially what they're doing here is allowing you to play a select amount, I would assume it's gonna be limited to big AAA titles. It's not gonna be every game out there, especially a lot of the indie ones, games that can be beaten in low amounts of hours, like, you know, something like this. But for the bigger games, they are going to allow players to download the game first and basically play an extended demo. And I can see the business strategy behind this. Essentially, they are trying to get people to play something that they otherwise wouldn't necessarily risk the 60 or $70 investment on, to play it, see that they like it, and then encourage them to then buy it. Because if you get these game trials this way, and say you play all six hours of Death Stranding, you're six hours in, you won't have to start over. When you purchase the game, you'll basically activate the license on the you know demo version that you've been playing on already, and you'll be able to continue your progress from that point onwards after, again, purchasing that license. So it's a way to, again, encourage people to try games that they might not otherwise buy or they might be unsure of to try and hook them in and to secure more sales. So I personally think this is a great idea. You know, if you're going and buying a car, you get the option to test drive the car. Why not kind of extend that luxury to other areas when it's applicable? So I think it's pretty neat. I don't think they'll be including lengthy trials on games, like I said, that have like a 10 hour story and then you're done. Like maybe even stuff like God of War, it's a long enough game at 30 hours. I could see them offering like the new God of War Ragnarok, maybe like a three hour trial for maybe, but that game probably will sell itself. It's got a big enough fan base. So potentially they'll stick with certain titles that are a little bit more, you know, unheard of, a little bit more questionable. Again, I think this was Hideo Kojima's first game as kind of a fully independent studio. We can, before he was working with Konami, then he split off. So, you know, not as many people tried it. So it seems like a good idea to offer this type of service for games like that. With that being said, we'll obviously keep you updated if any banger games come out and are available to play on the list or any changes to the system. Maybe they had PS4 down the road. Of course, we'll keep you up to date. With that being said, keeping in tune with PlayStation news, the October 21 PlayStation Now lineup has leaked with the games that they're adding to PlayStation Now. Again, this does seem like PlayStation's attempt at competing with Game Pass. So they do offer games on this service that you can, I guess, essentially stream. So you don't have to download them. You can subscribe to the service and just be streaming games Essentially, to my understanding, that's how it works. Very similar to Game Pass. I mean, potentially you do install them as well, but it's just a library of games that's kind of set up to compete with Game Pass. I've never actually used it, didn't subscribe to it. I just know that it is, you know, 
kind of in that same vein. So with that being said, what are the games themselves? It seems like The Last of Us 2 has been added. Um, Last of Us has become one of the most important franchises for Sony since it was first released at the tail end of PlayStation 3's lifespan. The PS4 remaster of the original game was one of the best selling and highest rated games of the PS4 generation. The sequel became the fastest selling PS4 exclusive ever when it sold 4 million copies during its release weekend. Last of Us 2 then went on to become the third highest grossing game in PlayStation history. For the few people who happen to miss out on it, the new addition to PlayStation Now is a great time to catch up on the game. So a little history lesson on The Last of Us there. Other additions are going to be Fallout 76, which was generally widely memed upon upon release, but apparently now it's in much better state. If you're a Fallout fan, it's potentially worth checking out if you're already subscribing to this service. Desperados 3, Final Fantasy 8 Remastered, and probably a, a couple others, but that's all that's listed here. With that being said, I know for a fact that Final Fantasy 8 Remastered is on Game Pass, and it just makes sense for Sony to have it up. Final Fantasy and Sony are almost kind of like linked in your head. You know, when you think of Final Fantasy, I generally think Super Nintendo or Sony. So it's good that they are maybe trying to be competitive with Game Pass. You don't want Game Pass to be the only option because then when they have that monopoly on the service, generally things can change in less consumer-friendly ways. So I am happy that PlayStation is at least putting up some competition, but it doesn't really seem like they're winning against Game Pass. I think Game Pass still is taking the dub here, but again, the option to have more options is always more healthy in a free market economy. So I'm happy about that. If you're interested in any of these games, feel free to check them out on PlayStation now. We've got a couple other topics left. It shouldn't take too long to get through. These are just kind of more quirky topics, more news update related stuff, but not directly tech or you know video game production related. Metroid Prime producer reveals the axed open world game plans, essentially for Metroid Prime 3. What this article goes into depth talking about is that the original plan for Metroid Prime 3 was going to be a much less linear game, kind of open world exploration, maybe even multiple worlds via the usage of her spaceship to travel around to different points. And eventually what it came to was that th their plans for Prime 3 were just too ambitious. It does state that a lot of these things were, you know, kind of put in the pocket to be saved for later. So if we ever do end up seeing a Metroid Prime 4, It'd be very interesting if they pull out a lot of these prototype ideas to give Metroid a very significantly different experience. Okay, as we all know, the Metroid Dread will be coming out very soon. We'll be playing it over on Twitch, of course, but that's going for what it seems to be a much more like vintage classic Metroidvania type experience. Whereas from this article, what we can tell is that Prime 3 would have been basically the polar opposite of that. So, you know, something more in line, I don't want to say GTA, but that's just one of the most widely known like open world kind of action games where you're just available to go around to different places. Maybe even sprinkled in with a little something like kind of a No Man's Sky or what is that uh, RPG that's that everyone loves? I don't know the the uh, Bioware one. You know the, you know what space RPG I'm talking about, chat. I just it's it's slipping my mind but right now. So with that being said, kind of seems like that type of open world kind of action experience, um, and it just they couldn't cut it because back in the day they just they didn't have enough resources to deal with. But it does specify that we may be looking forward to something neat should they ever revisit the Prime series for a Prime Four. Maybe it will go in a different direction offer a completely different gameplay experience that uh, Metroid fans may not be used to, but if done right, I think it could still be really good having Samus grow outside of, you know, what people are generally accustomed to. If done well, I think it would be a fun experience because the Prime series overall was, was extremely popular. So moving on to the next thing here, the last, all the last pieces of news, we have our Battlefield 24 related, Battlefield 2042 related, sorry. Battlefield 24, I don't think they've made that many games yet. With that being said, Battlefield 2042 will use easy anti-cheat and cross-platform bans. This is, article is kind of like cross-supported by something I covered last week, which was talking about how the Steam Deck itself would be getting support to easy anti-cheat and other forms of, you know, anti-cheat as well. So this is very good. Apparently DICE is, you know, they, they've been, this is not their first rodeo. They've been making PVP first person shooter games for quite a while now. They're well aware of all the different types of ways that people will try to cheat and exploit and gain an advantage. And it seems like they're putting their foot down very firmly to say that 
they're not going to participate or accept any of that, you know, none of that. So if you get caught cheating on Steam, you'll be banned from playing on the Xbox, PlayStation, all the other platforms the game will be out on. Basically, they'll have, I guess, some type of IP or account detection where it's going to try and lock out as many of the cheaters as possible. Understandably, with it being a cross-platform game, this is of extra concern because people could figure out an exploit for one console that affects everyone on all platforms, and then they have to specifically find it, target it, and deal with it, which is much more difficult than if the game is just running on like a single platform. Or even if the game is running on multiple single platforms, but those platforms can only participate with each other. That makes it much easier to keep track of this type of stuff. But in the modern era of 2021, we love to see our multiplayer cross-play games where I can play on PC with my friends on PlayStation so that we can convince Truth to actually play games because he'll still get trophies. I mean, because man will not buy a PC game to save his life. He only cares about them PSN trophies. So with that being said, I'm particularly happy that Battlefield 2042 will have aggressive anti-cheat. Hopefully it doesn't become a security concern with like that, you know, core zero kernel access level stuff. But with that being said, since I never ever cheat in video games, I'm willing to put up with a certain amount of this to ensure that I get a fun experience that I paid for without being, you know, abused and trolled around all the time by wall hackers and aimbotters. Keeping on with Battlefield 2042, many of you may have seen the rumors coming from Reddit that Battlefield 2042 is about to be delayed until 2022. To stress again that that in and of itself was a huge rumor. So I'm starting and stopping this story with the beginning and hopefully the end of the rumor here. Because again, someone did come out on Reddit and say that they were expecting the game to be delayed until 2022. That's a huge delay when it's technically supposed to come out next month. And that was all related to information they were getting from the beta, the delays that we've seen so far, yada, yada, yada. But another article quickly came out from a, I guess, well-reputable leaker shutting down the March 2022 delay rumors, basically calling them BS, and that based on what's been going on, that the official release date for next month, November 19th, was going to stay consistent. So it's been a long road since Battlefield 2042 was originally revealed in June 2021. Since then, we've had the official portal reveal, the Exodus short film, the return of BF4's Irish as a specialist, and confirmation of the game's anti-cheat and its future, which is basically what I just covered. Battlefield 2042 was originally on slate for October release, but was delayed to 20 or November 19, 2021, after the game needed a few more weeks of polishing. The open beta arrives this week, but notable leaker Tom Henderson has shut down a new rumor that the game has been further delayed until March 2022. Of course, you can see his post series basically calling the Reddit post about the delay BS. Everyone I've spoke to says it will release November 19th, regardless of the beta, because the team is confident it's ready. And he was basically just trying to shut down that rumor there. It's also, you know, the rumor kind of popped up because there was like that new game mode that's coming in Battlefield 2042. The one that's supposed to be like a fusion of Escape from Tarkov and a couple other like modern Battle Royale style of get in, get out games. So there haven't been too many details leaked or talked about because of that. That was one of the other reasons why people thought it was going to end up getting delayed. But essentially, we have another leaker coming out and shutting down that rumor. Again, both of these past two articles that I put out are highly in the rumor zone. I would take them with a serious grain of salt, and I would anticipate that until further notice, the November 19th release date is consistent. Just wanted to kind of mention this, because I'm sure many of y'all may have seen this kind of back and forth pop up over the weekend. So now that we've got all that covered, I think that's about all for today on Monday. Hopefully y'all did enjoy the news coverage here. And if you have any questions or comments or anything that you think that you want covered or addressed, feel free to leave them down below. And again, with that being said, please hit the sub button, the bell, if you enjoy the content. Hit the like button as well, help spread it out. If you if you are in support of it, help spread out the uh, algorithmic love so that hopefully we can get some more eyes on the video. And until next time, this is Nazdarachi. I'll see you again soon and peace out, everybody.